10.45. So today, Parashat Miketz. Let's talk a little bit about the name of the word Miketz. It says, the Torah says, Vayi Miketz Shnatayim Yamim. It happened at the end of two years. And the question is, the story of Pharaoh would have been enough to say that Pharaoh had a dream that nobody could interpret it until they called Yosef. What was it necessary to tell us that it happened exactly two years after the last event? So let's analyze the rabbis who in their very profound analysis of the text always ask the questions, why did the Torah inform us of this event, which appears to be irrelevant? Well, so the rabbis give a very interesting explanation. They say it's not irrelevant to tell us that it happened two years after. After what? So we saw the previous parsha ended with the fulfillment of the prophecy, or the, I'm sorry, the fulfillment of the dream that the cupbearer of Pharaoh had in the prison, which Yosef had interpreted correctly, that he was going to be um, restored to his position next to the Pharaoh. And he also told him that Please make sure that when you go to the court, you remember me and you release me from pr prison because it's, I am unjustly here. So this is what happened in the previous parsha. In fact, the parsha ends with a very ominous word, that the cupbearer, as soon as he came out of the prison, he forgot Yosef. So here we come and it says, immediately after this is, and after two years, or two years after, the rabbis say, this is to teach us that had it not been for Yosef asking for help from this man, a human being, if he would have simply trusted in Hashem, he would have released even earlier. The, the, the duration of two years, the delay in his release of two years was in a sense a payback, kind of a punishment for his relying on people rather than relying on Hashem. And the Midrash says, quotes the famous verse from Yirmiyahu, Baruch HaGever Sheivtach Vashem, Vaya Hashem Yivtacho, blessed is the person who trusts in God and puts all his trust in God, but cursed is the man who puts his uh, um, uh, trust in flesh, and flesh and blood. So in a way, the Midrash suggests, Yosef is being in some way, penalized for having trusted a man instead of trusting Hashem. Now, that is one way in which we can look at this um, uh, information that is just at the two years. But there is another way of doing it also. And this is a concept that we find in Jewish philosophy, in the Midrash, very often. We know that Hashem conducts the world in different ways with different people, a lot depending on how the person himself approaches life. Let me explain. If a person has a superior trust in Hashem to such an extent that he believes that nothing is impossible for God, that he does not need to do any activity that Hashem can intervene directly and in every pass, in every way without having to do anything. That we as human beings have to do nothing. That Hashem, if we Hashem wants something, he, He'll give it to us. So we don't need to pray to Hashem and be worthy to receive it. That's one way of looking at how Hashem conducts the world. But there's another way, and that is the way what we call the natural way. When we do actions, which are the, I would say the beginning of a process that is a shem that completes it. Or to put it perhaps in another simile, we create a little receptacle on which a shem can pour his blessings. Just very much like the story of the woman in the prophets, the Shunammite, who is very poor and, and the prophet comes to help her and he says to her, do you have anything? 
And she says, yes, I have a little jug of oil. So he says, okay, give me the jug of oil and bring me all empty vessels, as much as many vessels as you can get. And he begins to pour the oil into each empty vessel. And there are hundreds of empty vessels. And he fills them all up until there's no more empty vessel. And then the, the, wine stop, wine, the, the oil stops. So it's interesting in that story, we see that the blessing or the miracle doesn't come you know, in the abstract or uh, on nothing. It comes on to the existing oil. And this is a similar activity that we have to do. We have to make the effort and Hashem blesses our efforts to expand it, to make it successful. In a way, it's almost like saying that, you know, I first have to invest money into a business, and this is Shem that makes me um, makes the business prosper if he wants to, and and makes it makes it that we can get the the, the wealth that we are asking. You know, money doesn't just come, you know, like rain from from heaven without any effort. It comes as a result of, or or rather, it comes as a um, fulfillment or completion of the, the act that we initiated. And this idea is expressed by the rabbis in the concept of Mida Keneged Mida, or Mida Keneged Mida, which means that Hashem responds to us in the way we, we, we turn to Him. So if we have a 100% undiluted faith that everything comes from Him, and that all we need to do is just ask and Hashem will give it to us, and that says Hashem, then in that case, will repay people in that manner. If given the, the things that they need without any, any, any effort on their part. But if we believe that, you know, that, well, maybe we need to work in order to be able to make money. We need to plant in order to be able to, 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 to harvest. So in that case, Hashem will not give us things in this supernatural way, but he'll give it to us in a normal way. So we could see that the effort that Yosef made in trying to bring some salvation through the form of the cup bearer was also justified, but it had a price. You want to work according to the ways of nature? You want to um, abide by the, the concepts the normal concepts of, um, of, of of a natural process, fine. So then you have to then wait for the process to go in a natural order. It can, you cannot expect the order's process to be faster because it's not a supernatural process. It is a, pro, a divine help, but it is a help that is provided in the form of nature. And this is a very philosophical concept that we we say that miracles sometimes uh, come in two forms. One, they come as miracles that look like miracles and you know something that supernatural that we do not know where it came from, but we know that it came from Hashem. Or miracles can come disguised in the garb of natural events. And when they come that way, <coughs> these guys are natural events. They may not look like miracles. You have to look into it to see that they're miracles. So we, in Hebrew, we call this nes nistak, a miracle that is disguised, like a, a um, incognito. And it, you know, I want to point out that that is ultimately the the, um, the issue of how we look at life. We can look at life as, as uh, only natural processes and nothing, and the hand of God is not there. Or we can look at, at, at nature and see everything in nature is, act, as, is done by Hashem and it's done every minute. Not just that it happened once and it just continues automatically. We say in the morning, Hashem renews every single day the creation. 
That means it's not just because he created it, it's going to continue. No, every day it's sort of supporting, it's like holding the laws of physics that keep the world the way it is. And although we think that, you know, the laws of physics are going to be here forever, Hashem is the one who, in a sense, maintains it. And if one minute he, he doesn't keep it, they will go away. You know, I, I want to tell you a quick story. Um, I don't know if I ever mentioned it before. I subscribed once to a, to a music um, program um, you know, with Apple. And, um, you know, they're giving us a lot of music, classical music. I love some operas. And so I downloaded it into my phone. And, uh, and two or three months later, I stopped the subscription. I figured, you know, I don't need it anymore. And I already had them in my phone. I don't need to, to pay them anymore. The moment the subscription ended, I could not hear the music anymore. It doesn't matter if it's in my phone, not my phone. They took it out of my phone. I do not know how it happened. But I realize that the music in my phone is only by virtue of Apple saying, you can keep this music. And the moment they say you cannot keep it, doesn't matter if I download it, that download it, no more music. In a way, this is the way that Hashem we think Hashem is the world going to be here all the time. The moon, the sun, the star. One minute, Hashem can change one physical law, the whole thing would collapse. The whole, the whole point of gravita gravitation and, and, and all the whole concept of electromagnetism and all of these things are so connected that if Hashem were to interrupt this, these principles in one instant, it will cease to exist. So Hashem is the one maintains everything, but it maintains it in a way that is not always viewed as a miracle. Albert Einstein, the famous physicist, said that there are two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle. And the other one is that you think everything is a miracle. And that, I think, is the, the decision that we have to see. So the, we, we have to choose how to live. So Yosef could have done nothing and could have trusted in Hashem. According to the rabbis, he was in a sense punished because he could have seen that everything that was happening to him happened for, to advance him. He came to the jail and in the jail, he, instead of being a servant in one a private home, he now became a general manager of a public institution, a very important institution because the ministers of the court are sent to that prison. So he didn't go with some sort of petty criminals. Why did Hashem put him in this jail? And then why did these two ministers happen to sin at the same time? But they were both in jail. And interestingly enough, uh, John point out, you, you recall the story. Let's analyze the story. Yosef is there with two, um, with two, Yosef is there with two, um, with two, um, with two prisoners, and the prisoners are a, um, you know, they both have a dream. And uh, they both have a dream. And uh, what would happen if there only, if only one, one of them? One of them would have been there. He would have interpreted the dream. It would have been perhaps the same thing. He would have been able to go to Pharaoh anywhere. And I think the answer is no. You needed two win two ministers because, and one of them had to be positive, one of them had to be negative. Because if there was only one minister, there had been only one minister who sinned and who had a dream and Yosef interpreted it. And he said, oh, don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. The Pharaoh will return you to restore you to your place. That wouldn't mean anything. 
because the minister would say, but of course, well, I'm a minister, I'm an important person in the court. I have a dream, he's going to tell me that something bad is going to happen to me. He doesn't happen. The fact that he told me it was okay, he doesn't mean anything, he just guessed. But when there were two ministers, one of them saw that to one minister, he really gave it a negative interpretation. Then he, and that interpretation was fulfilled. Then he realized that Yosef wasn't just guessing that this was a real uh, interpreter of dreams. He knew and understood it. So he needed two ministers to come. And in the prison, he was very friendly with them. In fact, the, 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 um, the uh, Torah tells us that the, the prisoners were assigned to him, or he was assigned to the prisoners, so that he was in charge of these two prisoners. And we assume that he had a good connection with them because you see when he, when he comes in, he says to them, why are you angry? Why, why are you have? So he's actually very friendly with them. He saw that these two people were, you know, and they were teaching him about the court and telling them all the things that he needed that he eventually would utilize as he became a vizier in the, in, in the court. So all of these things that Hashem had provided for him in the way that it, it happened should have told him Hashem is with him. So there was no need for him to go and ask the man to help him. The fact that he didn't have him made him that whatever is going to happen to him earlier or sooner happened a little later. And that's why it says, It happened at the end, and only at the end of two years that the salvation began. We now go into the next subject that's perhaps more important than all the subjects here that we're going to be discussing today. <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking about the dreams of Pharaoh. And I have a question. How did Yosef understand? How did Yosef was able to get, guess or understand, not, not, interpret, decipher the meaning of the dreams? Another question, we will see that Yosef not only interprets a dream, but Yosef also is going to tell Pharaoh what to do. So we're going to have a question. We understand that Pharaoh told him to interpret the dream. There was a little bit of chutzpah, a little bit of um, arrogance on his part, improper to tell the Pharaoh what to do, which it was not that he was asked. So how come the Pharaoh did not, was not objecting to that, or the other people? All right, so let's take a look a little bit at the, at the dream. And the dream appears twice. Um, not only the two dreams, There's, the dreams appear twice, but the, the, the dreams are repeated. Once when they happen, and once when he is telling it to Pharaoh, to, to Yosef, I'm sorry. So let's take a look a little bit about the dream. When behold, oh, he says, Pharaoh was dreaming and behold, he was standing over the river. Now this is a very strange word, over the river. Because people don't stand on, over something, unless he's flying. The word over, implies some sort of superiority, some sort of dominion, like a king is over his subjects. We'll continue in a moment. Behold, out of the river, there emerged seven cows of beautiful appearance, and they were grazing in the marshland. And then behold, seven other cows emerged after them, ugly of appearance and very skin flesh, skinny, and they stood next to the cows on the bank of the river. Point out, a moment quickly, this word, and they stood out next to the cows. And the cows of ugly appearance ate the seven cows of beautiful appearance. They ate it, and Pharaoh walked. And then he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, seven years of grain sprouting on the single stalk, healthy and good. And then seven ears, they were bad, scourge, 
growing up to them in seven years, swallowed up, and they ate the other healthy ones. Okay, and this was a dream. So Pharaoh awoke, and then he calls all the magicians and tries to tell them, ask them what, what does it mean? And nobody's able to answer it. Now, let's ask ourselves, why not? But then they figure out something. Um, and that we'll discuss in, in this year. So eventually he brings Yosef and uh, the cupbearer tells him, you know, the, there was a Hebrew youth there. He knew how to interpret the, the, um, the, um, the dreams. So they called the sent him and he comes. See there, by the way, <clears throat> the the fact that it says that one of the things that they did is he shaved. Um, this is the pasuk that he shaved. We look at, at the at the um, figures and and sculptures in um, and paintings of Egyptians. You see that the the people were unshaven. So and Jews, you know, they were shaved. They were always with beards. Um, you know, so for him, they were, they, they, they shaved him. Um, so he comes to Pharaoh, and um, the first thing that Pharaoh says is, I understand you're, you're a very, you're a super magician. I hear you're a great dreamer, a great interpreter of the dreams. The first thing that Yosef says is, not I, is God. It's a little bit strange that he would say such a thing to a man who himself thought he was a god, who didn't know anything about this god that Joseph is talking about, who is an idol worshiper, very strange, suddenly introduces a theological concept in the middle of a conversation. We will get back to it in a moment. So Pharaoh apparently ignores that. If he thought it was an insult, you know, he you know, doesn't want to investigate, doesn't ask him, who is this God? What does it do? Simply, he goes into the business. He tells a story. And let's take a look at the story. It says, out of the river, there emerged seven cows of robust flesh and driven. They were grazing on the marshland. Suddenly, seven other cows emerged after them, scrawny and inferior. I've never seen like this. And the emaciated and inferior cows ate out the seven cows. There's one piece that is missing, if you pay attention to, to the difference between this verse in which Pharaoh is telling the, the dream and verse three, where the dream actually takes place. And that is a very important element. The, the, in the dream, and actually the, the seven skinny cows were standing next to the others. They came close to it. They were a, um, stood next to the cows on the bank of the river. That piece is eliminated from the, the dream. Now, I, I wanna tell you that this seems to me to be one of the crucial reasons why Yosef was able to interpret the dream in the way he did. We will discuss this part. The word parot, parot in Hebrew, means cows, but it also means fruits, well, pre. So Yosef understands that here we're talking about something that comes from the river. Cows don't come from the river. What comes from the river, the Nile in Egypt, is food, food to eat. The whole economy of Egypt was based and founded on the Nile River. So the fact that he omits this aspect is, is that, that they stood next to the other ones, gives an indication that the the skinny cows need to rely, to, to lean 
unto the hell and the fat cows. So Yosef, and, and it is possible that Yosef in his own had a vision of the dream, the way that Pharaoh saw it. Or it could be that in Pharaoh there was a kind of a a stop, like a lacuna, which that, that was missing this piece, as if he sort of wanted to hide it from Yosef to see what he would do. That Yosef provided it in his own insight. But either way, the idea that these cows, that the lean ones were leaning, were, were sort of being supported by the other ones, gives the implication that food that is available at one point is going to support the other ones. And of course, that's the other concept that they actually ate it. The, the cows eat the other cows. But I think that the fundamental question is how did Joseph figure out that this is about food and then no food? So I think that the, and this also answers the question of how we, or why the magicians were not able to figure it, out, figure it out. So let's analyze first of all, how did Joseph figure it out? Joseph realized that if the word fruit, parot means fruit, and the Nile is food, there's no such thing as a cow eating another cow. Obviously this is in itself not normal. So we are here in, in some sort of abnormal phenomenon that a person cannot dream. It's not something that is conceived, something that is beyond the imagination. And so the first thing that Pharaoh, that Yosef sees is that this is not just a prophecy of the future, but it is a message. And that I think is a real reason why the why the, the Pharaoh realizes that Joseph is right. Because Joseph was telling Pharaoh, this is not just telling you what's gonna happen, it's telling you what you should do. What you can do to solve the problem. Because otherwise. Why would you know one of the future? For no reason. The reason for the knowledge of the future is to be able to, 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 uh, to benefit from the knowledge, to be prepared to thwart, to stall the, the, the possible damage. And that's one of the reasons why the, the um, magicians were not able to, to get it. The magicians were saying the other interpretations. But it's seven and seven. So seven the cows means that you're gonna have seven daughters. And seven fat cows means you're gonna bury seven daughters. So Pharaoh said, so why do I need to know that? Whatever's gonna happen will happen. There's no nothing I can do about it. What is the message in this story? He realized it was something that it was a message that he could actually understand. And that's one of the reasons why we can see here the magician who comes from a pagan philosophy does not understand the gods as, being, as giving communication with, with, with human beings. The gods are simply forces of nature, in a sense blind, they do not have a will or, or, or a general relationship with man. They do what they do. So the Nile, like in one of the idols, which they considered to be an idol, was also a, a giver, automatic, a robot. So the Nile, they, they could not conceive of the Nile as giving any kind of message or anything giving a message. So that's why they couldn't understand that this dream was not just a prediction, but it was also a message of what can be done, how to do it. That also explains why the other question that I asked is how did Yosef 
have the chutzpah of telling him at the end of the dream, you should do this and do that, store the food and then distribute it later. You know, he was not asked to do that. The fact that he is asked, that, that he suggests that, is that it is in the dream. That is the reason for the dream. And that's why he says at the end, um, the dream of Pharaoh is a single one. And the two ideas are the same, whether the ears of the corn and the ears of the grain, of wheat and the, and the seven cows. And the dream is about God, what God is about to do, he has told Pharaoh. Here, Yosef introduces a totally different insight into, into the dream. The dream is not just some nonsense that a person could have thought, because it was not something that a human being can think of, as I said before, cows eating cows. But it is a message that has come from somewhere else. So this is the first time that Yosef not only introduced at the beginning, God will answer, but he introduces the concept of a God that is above the Nile, that is above the rivers, above nature, and that also above human beings. And sometimes it connects with human beings in a form of a communication, telling us what to do. This is a revolution. And Pharaoh, I think, is now for the first time experiencing, away from the pagans and away from the pagan mythology, the concept of a God that is above the, the river. Remember, paganism is essentially the divinization of, of nature. And nature is both static, in a way static because it, you know, what, it, what is, is, um, and and also blind. It does what it does. It doesn't matter why. The idea of a God, and also another thing as of nature, of course, is that nature is all separated. Each one works on its own. The sun dries the rain. The rain makes the thing wet. Everything works separately. The concept of a creator is that everything is integrated. And it is managed by one that is above all of them. And that wants to, to connect with man and tells them what to do and how to act. These are pure monotheistic concepts, which to a pagan mind were totally incomprehensible. That is the reason why the magicians cannot figure out the dream. But it's also why Pharaoh realizes and this is an insult of Pharaoh, that this dream had to be a message. And that I think is that the, because he wanted it to be, he thought it was going to be a message, that he had an insight. When Yosef comes and tells him, it's a, it's a message that you have seven years and you have to store the food away and then eventually the, 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 every of the thin years is going to eat into one of the five years because they're going to be eating the food that you store away. It makes sense. And that, I think, is the, the message of this, of this dream. The Nile that determines the entire economy of Egypt, that for them was a god in itself, now has become an agent of another greater power. And that Yosef is bringing into Pharaoh's mind. A God who warns Pharaoh, who helps, wants to help Pharaoh. A God that is more powerful than the Nile itself. And that brings me to the beginning of the Shear, where Pharaoh says, I was standing over the river. That gives him a sense to Pharaoh that he can control with the information provided by the creator, he can control the, 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 the Nile. He can control what comes on the Nile and the extraordinary harvest of, the, of those seven years 
that the Nile provides are not going to be erased by the seven years of famine that will follow because he has been able to bring from the Nile and store it away in a way that he'll be able to manage for the, the following seven years. And I think that's one of the interpretations that I believe give of the al -Ayyur. He had a sort of a, a perception. And maybe it is something in the mind of Pharaoh that Pharaoh himself may have already had a latent understanding that, that a person can be over the Nile. But as a pure pagan person, could not even fathom how. And that's why when he repeats the dream to, to Yosef, look what it says. It says, I'll point out this the difference. It says, in, in my dream, I was standing next to the shore of the river, on the shore of the river, not over the river, because he's embarrassed to say over the river. But he felt that he could do it. And that, so that's another reason why I believe that Pharaoh had a, a unspoken feeling that this was a message and that from whom we did not know. And Yosef explains it to him. It's a God who's telling you what, what's going to happen. And that God is above the Nile. And just like you, as a human being, with God's instruction, following God can also be over, over the Nile. This, by the way, over nature. This is actually something that we can all um, appreciate in Jewish thought, that we, we are not slaves of nature, that we control nature in some way. Uh, we certainly can use nature. And to our advantage, we and that we do not worship it. Nature is there to serve us. And we are above it because just as God is above nature, we are above nature. Above natural, you know, the nature itself in general. Um, and something about our nature. There's some things we cannot change, it's true, but we can some way, you know, today's Rosh Kodesh. So remember that one of the messages of Rosh Kodesh is that we, the, the core decides when is the new moon, which appears to be unnecessary since anybody can look at the sky and see when the new moon appears. But that is precisely why the Torah tells us that at Rosh Kodesh you have to, the court has to decide when it's Rosh Kodesh. And even though astronomically, you may know that this day is the, the new moon appear in the sky somewhere above the clouds, if there are no witnesses, that the procedure that is followed in the way of when um, normally we, we look at the moon, we, uh, we investigate the witnesses, and then the court comes and declares there is Rosh Hodesh. Without that process, it's not Rosh Hodesh. Then we say the next day Rosh Hodesh. That's another way of manifesting the power that we have over nature. And similarly, we have a power over our, our own nature. So then I think this is the dream, uh, the, the message that Pharaoh receives from, from Yosef. The Nile is not all powerful. And also, by the way, in a side point that I forgot to mention, the fact that the Nile is going to, some years are going to give you a lot of food and some years are not, means that the Nile is not constant. It doesn't know what they're doing. The Nile is going crazy. And the fact that the Nile is going crazy is, is a indication that it is not a reliable source of support. Um, and that's the, the idea also that it is not, it's not a God. So in all this incredible scene, we've discovered, I just want to review with you, discover that Pharaoh is being transformed from a pure pagan person into a person who's beginning to think along the lines of monotheism. Abandoning the concept of the Nile that was so important for the Egyptian economy, abandoning it from a perspective that it is a god and realizing there is a power over the Nile that is more important. 
and that that power that is over the Nile is connected with him. And that the dream is comes to give him a message. And in a way he has to be grateful to that, to that creator for the message and also begins to understand that he belongs, he's on the level of, a, of the God, the creator, not on the level of the river. And those that I said, he's over the river. He felt an, an innate feeling that Yosef confirms and develops into the greater sense. And that's why Yosef was able to picture the, the story very well. He knew he believed in a God who was communicating with us, who talked to us, who cared about us, who protected us. All of these things that the pagans do not have in their furthest imagination, they never think of God that way. And here comes a, a Hebrew man with this idea that talking about God, talking about a creator, talking about somebody who is above nature, somebody who is connecting with human beings and that elevates us into another level away from the Nile. A beautiful, beautiful message. And I think that now we can also understand why Yosef has the capacity because he understands the message. So he tells him the seven years of famine will arise. And so you need to do find a person who's you know organize the land of, of Egypt and appoint overseers, prepare the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance, gather all the food, all these things that he tells them is not part of the dream. In fact, it is part of the dream. That's what the dream is telling. But the that the pharaoh, the, the lean cows are going to lean on the fat cows. So that means that the fat cows have to be able to provide for the lean years as well. I want to end with one um, important point, which I think uh, you may have heard about it in my history class. And that is the normally we understand the seven years of famine to be a years of drought. Um, it's interesting that the Torah never mentions the word drought. It says seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So of poverty, the poverty that we are talking about here is an inability to grow food. There were no rains in Egypt, very infrequent. The whole idea was the Nile. So the Nile always had more or less a, a regular flow of water. It never had a lot less, but it did have sometimes a lot more. When more water came into Egypt, into the land, it flooded the fields. Normally it flooded the fields a little bit, and after the waters receded, they were able to plant. But in these years, some extraordinary climate um, change occurred that in those seven years, the water of the Nile had exceeded the normal, flood, the normal levels. And it was such a flood that it never receded. So they were not able to plant. The water was all over the fields. We have archaeologically discovered that the Nile uh, in certain banks of the Nile and the, the lower Egypt, in the upper Egypt, they had the engineers used to mark, mark the, the level of the Nile or the water every year. And according to the way that archaeologists have figured it out, during the years that we believe the, the story of Yosef was taking place, the, the levels of the water had been very high and consistently high for, for a few years. So that explains that that's what was happening in those seven years. The reason there, were no, there was no food was because they were not able to plant. And we get this also <clears throat> from the story in Vaigash later when um, Yosef tells the brothers to come to live uh, in, um, in, um, in Egypt and uh, because it's not gonna be food. And he says to them, the seven years there'll be no um, planting and no harvest. And the question is, you know, even if, if you're talking about drought, there's no rain, I mean, you still plant to try 
to get some water will come. You don't stop planting. The fact that it says there's no planting or harvesting means that they couldn't plant even, which co corresponds to the concept that these seven years wasn't a years of drought, but a years of flooded. There's also a story that there's a canal that is adjacent to the Nile River that goes into a, into a lake, which is probably kind of a drain, a drainage system. And that canal, interestingly enough, is called Bar Yusuf, the Canal of Yosef, which apparently refers to the story of Yosef or 3,500 years ago. So in any case, this, that concludes the, the analysis, this beautiful analysis of, um, of the dreams why Yosef was able to figure them out and the message that he gives Pharaoh, that you don't, don't believe in the Nile anymore. The Nile is inconstant, but there is a God who can tell you how to live. Okay. Uh, I have a question.